welcome back to the second episode of Ask Prebuilt. Last week you guys came through with a bunch of questions we'll be answering today about Seven Days to Die Valheim, general things, and me. If you want your question featured in a future video, do me a favor and start your comment with Ask Prebuilt so that I can easily find it. Let's get into those questions. Question one here comes from Merso who asks, Killing zombie cops sometimes drops their security clothing. Is there some use for them? Also, you can't even enter the radiation zone when using the suit. Maybe the fun pimps had something planned for the radiation zones. Now, what I'm assuming you mean by the first part is that there is, is there a use for these clothing piles that cops leave behind when they explode? And no, there isn't. It's just a body part. Uh, this is a good opportunity though to point out that the bodies revert to their Alpha 19 model when this does happen, which better be fixed in Alpha 21 or I'll be very upset because it's literally unplayable. The second part here about radiation suits that you get from loot drops is a bit more interesting. The hazard suits in the game are currently completely useless, they're just clothing items that provide heat and cold resistance. Going to the edge of the map with one on will still kill you with radiation, it does not do anything at all. And there's no way to currently stop that in the game aside from using god mode. But the devs do slash did intend to add radiation suits to the wasteland at some point, even telling us about radiation suits, radiation meds, radiation proof mods for your armor. But this hasn't come into the game yet and is still not even listed for Alpha 21, so we can assume that if radiation zones are still coming, they'll come after the fun pimps rework the armor system and give the radiation suit an updated look. We can probably expect that to happen in Alpha 22 or in a hypothetical Alpha 23, but that could be hundreds of years from now, so who knows? Our second question comes from Joni Letiverta, who wants to know if you blow up a whole POI, do you get the XP from the zombies inside? The answer to that is no. When you're walking around the world in Seven Days to Die, the vast majority of zombies you encounter in POIs are actually not there until you walk into the POI and then walk close to the room they're in for performance reasons. So if you try and blow up the tower from the outside or collapse it, most of the zombies just aren't even going to be spawned in yet. And with regards to the building collapsing, if they do die from that, even if they were spawned in and they did die from that, you wouldn't get the XP for it because gravity is not you. So no, you won't get XP for blowing up entire buildings unless you go floor by floor from the top down. Our third question comes from the Beast, and they want to know is a foundation actually needed? Can I not just build my base on top of dirt or do I really need to dig out one deep? This is a question I get a lot and I really do wonder why people are so worried about using the extra 10 blocks it takes to do this, but let's go over it. A foundation recessed into the terrain is not strictly needed because the support from bedrock is all that matters with vertical support, so as long as there is a block below your base all the way down to bedrock, you'll be fine. But it is a risky play to not put your base one or two blocks into the terrain because dirt is extremely weak and sometimes zombies just dig randomly and that could leave your base unsupported quite quickly in the middle of horde night. And more worryingly is demolition zombies will very easily wipe out terrain if they explode. So in short, you don't need foundations, but it's a very good idea to use that tiny little extra bit of resources and time to do that just to make sure your base is demolition zombie proof later on in the game. Our next question comes from Jefferson, will Jen ever return my affection? No! Our next question comes from Mr. Fox. Do you agree that Seven Days to Die is both too easy and too hard at the same time? Kinda. On the one hand, playing the game on the hardest settings with low loot, insane nightmare, barrel sense, high enemy block damage, all that kind of thing is honestly not that hard if you just make a good build and pay attention to your surroundings. But then, if you start throwing in even more settings, like turning the day length down, it starts to become very immediately completely unplayable for extended periods of time. Alternatively, if you play any settings optimally with traders and micromanaging your time and just playing intelligently, the game just becomes trivial. But if you play the other way, the game becomes very slow paced and very poorly balanced. Like not playing with traders makes the games easily three times as hard and two times slower, but considerably more boring because it just draws out the length of the game rather than adding any content that someone who is playing the game faster wouldn't see. But playing either of these ways is going to get boring very quickly, you're going to get burned out of doing the same thing with a very efficient playstyle, and you're going to get bored of the slow pacing of a very slow playstyle. So neither of these extremes are really having a good time. 
Yes, I would kind of agree, the game is very hit or miss when it comes to its difficulty. Developers have what seems to be a strange philosophy on how they play the game, where they seem to expect players to fluctuate between playing efficiently and more role-playing, slow-paced gameplay in the same playthrough. But I don't know of anybody who does both of these things. People who play at really fast speeds and really hard settings don't sometimes in the middle of a playthrough switch to playing really relaxed and vice versa. So I don't really know who who the game is balanced for, but it seems to be balanced specifically for the fun pimps and people who play in their very strange fluctuating style. Anyway, our next question comes from Fastbreak. What's the best and worst aspects of Valheim? So Valheim is one of my favourite games because it's an early access survival game that isn't a complete scam. It came out in a very playable state with a lot of content and all of the content in Valheim is very very deliberate, unlike say, Seven Days to Die. It's not caked in this residue of being in development for years and years with old systems, redundant items, aged models, complete design philosophy overhauls midway through development. You can really feel the love and thought that went into Valheim. And while not every single thing in Valheim is perfect, because even if you put a lot of thought and attention into a feature, sometimes it just misses and that's just how game development is. But I can really forgive those mistakes because I genuinely can feel how thought out and deliberate the game is compared to some of its competitors, whose games seem to have been developed by a drunk dev team with a dartboard. So I can really appreciate how Valheim is actually made, but it isn't a perfect game by any means. By far the worst aspects of it though are the grind of certain parts of the game and the world generation. The Bronze Age of the game is too long if you play the way the developers kind of encourage, which is getting everything becoming very prepared and moving on to the next stage. If you do that with the Bronze age it will take a lot longer than all the other ages of the game. It'll probably take you as long as the Iron Age and the Silver Age combined, maybe even a little bit of the time you would be spending in the Black Metal Age just to get through the Bronze Age. It's a real slog with a very, very slow gameplay loop that really turns off a lot of players in that early stage of the game, which is very unfortunate for Valheim. I feel like they probably should have slowed the game down somewhere later on so that players got to experience more of the content and were a little bit more invested and a little bit more trusting of the game, because as it stands, a lot of players do hit the Bronze Age. They spend ages grinding out bronze and they just get turned off thinking, oh, there's six bosses, there's like six stages to this game, they're all going to be slow and boring like this, and then they stop playing. And I remember that being an issue with a lot of people when Valheim first came out. But if you can get through that grind, or if you can find nice little ways to skip through parts of the Bronze Age, like going into the Iron Age as underprepared as you physically can, it is a lot better. And the other thing, world generation, is a small thing, but it's just that Sometimes it can be a real pain when you've invested 20 hours into a world just to find out that you have to go on an hour long boat ride to find the third or fourth boss or to find a biome that has the resources you need in it, which means that you almost have to use a seed viewer to find a world you can actually tolerate playing for 200 hours. It isn't the biggest issue, but I'm always going to dock points for needing a third party software to actually make the game a tolerable pace. It's something I criticise Minecraft for, and it's something I criticise Valheim for. It may be just a personal thing, but it really annoys me. But those two issues are genuinely dwarfed by how amazing Valheim is. If you haven't tried this game, get on it. It's pretty cheap and it's got a lot of content, hundreds of hours of content pretty easily. Gaming After 50 wants to know, have you ever built a 7 days to die POI or had the desire to do so? Kind of, I've had the want to do it, though I've never really sat down to do it. My creativity was severely damaged by what I can only assume was my education. I'm not particularly good at working without structure and formula and just drawing inspiration from my own imagination, which makes making 3D environments very, very difficult. It's not impossible, it would take me a lot longer to make a good level compared to someone who just has that talent and creative spark. I might do it one day, it's actually one of my biggest goals as an adult to cultivate my creativity creativity and try and undo the damage done by, I think, 17 years of education that I feel like tries to slightly kill your creativity in favour of performing menial tasks efficiently while following strict instruction. I kind of felt my creativity dying throughout my education and I feel the mental blocks that are there whenever I try and do creative stuff and I really want to try and undo that. So when I do, or maybe part of the process of fixing that, 
I will be doing things like making POIs, assuming I'm still playing 7 Days to Die at that time. It's also very time consuming, which you do have to consider. Our next question comes from Into the Ether. I want to know if you think we will be able to use zombies against bandits, such as increasing heat around bandit bases and spawning in a screamer, or if perhaps bandits would be able to attack you on Horde Night. So we don't know too much about bandits, but we do know that they're going to be hostile to zombies. So yes, you should be able to pit them against each other in the same way that you can currently lure zombies into fighting animals by throwing rocks to distract zombies near the animals and letting that natural interaction happen. So I don't see why you couldn't do similar things with bandits. We don't really know fully yet, but I would imagine we can probably do that, which would all be very Far Cry-esque. Barton Tyrix wants to know, what are three games you wish people knew about slash got more recognition? Well, first of all, it would directly benefit me monetarily if more people played Seven Days to Die. So if I'm getting one wish to boost the game here, I'm using it on that. It's just smart business sense. But otherwise, I gotta give a shout out to Slime Rancher. It's a deceptively enjoyable game. It looks like some silly kids game, but it's quite similar to Valheim in the sense that you can feel how deliberate and thought out and well executed it is. It has so much love and care behind it. It really feels like playing a game that was made before early access was a thing, back when games were actually well thought out and finished when you bought them. Now, Slime Rancher actually did have an early access period, but the finished product doesn't feel like it was an early access game. It feels like a very deliberate and well executed game. It has a very fun gameplay loop if you like tycoon games. It has a pretty intriguing story and it's just very relaxing to play. Uh, and my last game, is going to be the 2017 Star Wars Battlefront 2. Not enough people know about this game's redemption arc. When it came out, it was content barren. It was responsible for the most downvoted comment in Reddit history. The game lived another three years after that, however, and in that time, it became genuinely the best multiplayer Star Wars game we've ever seen. All monetization was removed, they gave everyone access to all the heroes and all the villains, and they gave us so much content, they added so many new maps, new weapons, new game modes, new heroes and villains, particularly for Clone Wars era stuff, which is what won me over. I really enjoy the Clone Wars era of Star Wars, and they really spent like a year just dedicated to filling out that part of the game. Then in 2020, EA stole the entire dev team and put them to work on Battlefield 2042. And that is one of the biggest injustices in gaming ever. DICE had worked endlessly to bring Battlefront 2 away from the brink, and they worked so hard for basically no reason the game had made most of its money at that point to try and give the fans the game they deserved, and they did. But the game could have had a true renaissance going into the 2020s. Could have seen much more content, Mandalorian content, Rebels content, Kenobi content, Bad Batch content, even Andor, Ahsoka, Tales of the Jedi content. The EA left them with a skeleton crew, not that Disney show, and cut the support for the game just on the edge of the greatest redemption story in gaming. If you go back and play it now and you can actually find a lobby, it's genuinely amazing if you're a Star Wars fan, and it doesn't really deserve the stigma it still has from its original launch, and thanks to that stigma that the game never got to fully shed, we're probably never going to see a Battlefront 3, although I would be pleasantly surprised if we do. And finally, Raven wants to know, is there anything that surprised you since growing your community? Yeah, I was surprised to see what other videos my viewers watch. Yeah, you heard me, I get to see what videos a lot of my viewers watch, and in those lists, I always see those horrible, horrible Twitch compilations with a title like, she didn't know her camera was on, with a thumbnail of some attractive Twitch streamer stretching or something. Go sit in the corner and think about what you did. And while you're there, if you want your question answered in a future video, remember to put ask pre-built before you comment so I can easily search for that. It can be about seven days to die, me, or just general stuff. Most of the work on keeping this series going comes from you guys asking me the questions, so if you want to see it continue, keep the questions flowing and subscribe for more. Thank you to my channel members and patrons for making this video possible and thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.